like to welcome all of you and we hope you will have a, a lovely evening. So I thought I will give you a short, short history if I won't bore you too long of all, where all this started. So I think we can all agree this Jonker Sauerplans company started longer back than we thought. So if you see that little chap there, it's not uh, one of the young cousins, that's uh, my dad, Tini. Tini, just stand up there. He looks exactly as young. Now this started on a farm in Christiana when he was in the late 1940s when he saw an aircraft and he was running behind this aircraft until he reached the end of the farm. And this was probably where the passion for, for aviation started. And then in the 1960s, here, uh, maybe you can go to the next slide, he was a student at the Potchefstroom University and in his old motorcycle saw, uh, I think it was a sling speed towed by a tiger moth and they were doing, the military gliding club were doing some fun flying at Potchefstroom and he followed this until he saw the glider and this is his first encounter with real sailplanes. And then later he joined Mahali's gliding club and uh, if you can see that happy smile, he was the first person that went solo at the current Orient um, airfield. On the day they moved to Orient airfield, he went solo. So he was the first one going solo there and you can see in the next slide quite a happy chappy with his flowers in the K7 or something and then subsequently he was inspired to use his technical skills to develop and build his own glider. Not developed, he built it from scratch plants and you can see that everything, he cut the ribs out, he made all the welding, he even blowed his own canopy. I mean this guy is crazy. If you think we are, completely. There you can see how his uh, absolutely fantastic facilities were not so weatherproof as you might think. Um, and there he was doing the, the reaming of his main pins. And finally, one can see the result of his glider. And that is hanging in one of our tuck hangers. You can see this glider. And me and Ati had lots and hours of fun in this glider. So obviously, we were a little bit exposed to aviation from a young age. So from a young age, Ati was very technically minded. I was not so much. I was just talking, as you can see. And he was... <laughs> He was designing from the beginning, trying to build aircraft. I think he was very disappointed when that first model of his did not fly so well. The wing loading was a bit suspect, we, we realized last year. Um, when we remodeled it, Bossy remodeled it in the wind tunnel, we realized what the problem with that model is. So we can improve on that. If you can see there, the first actually board kit was a, was a working solution. And um, the guys in State 6 paint shop, lift your hands. Now you see why I'm in a paint shop, uh, can tell you what to do. I started quite early, no? that was our first project. <laughs> Guys, and I so, can so clearly remember the first day at Bloomhoff when we had our first glider there. You see that little guy, there was me, the, my uncle there in the, in the radio, my dad's brother, and my dad is instructed in the back of a K2. If there were any CAA guys here, they will ask, where's the registration numbers? Those days we didn't know about registration numbers. All right. So, and I can so vividly remember me and Ati sitting in the back of the K2 and having our first experience airborne and that, that, that effect when you release from the ground and it's so smooth. And I couldn't find a picture of that. But I found this one of Ati and Tini. I, I mean Tini and Christian, Ati's sons, were exactly the same situation, almost the same age when they had their first flight in a K7. So this is like 30 or 35 years later, the same experience that we as brothers had. There you can see Ati completing his first 50 kilometer flight in, the, in my dad's glider, landed at Ludwigstadt, completing his Silver Sea, very happy chappy. And then obviously he moved forward to fly the Stugvogel. You can see that guy with the hair, that's me. <laughs> really, I decided to change my style a bit. Maybe I should go back to that one. Guys, and then Ati obviously started with a lot of formulas, and he think, what must we do to make a proper glider? So all what we have done was done, done by mathematically modeling, and that was the formula that Ati derived to see how a J3 should work. So that bottom there, that is actually that, if you, if you do some algebraic, uh, what is it, manipulation and cross out, you will get to J3 in the end. I think, he told me that, and I believe him. Okay, guys. When we started in with the project, I was really involved in setting up a repair shop because this is the only way. I resigned from a proper job at Daniel Aviation with my best friend, Gideon. Gideon, we're working there at Daniel Aviation. And I resigned the job with a salary 
to start to do repairs and we were delighted when our first customers arrived and that was in the form of late Uncle Klaas Goudrand bringing his ASW22 there for us to refurbish. Man, what a cash flow injection if you have no job. And then the Goudrands were so lovely to support us with all their projects and refurbishments and Walter Burki and all the glider people. We even sold a wing walker to Mark Hutchins, you know, at quite a <laughs> profitable price, he says. <laughs> so the gliding community was actually quite very favorable. And finally the result was this, this uh, JS1 product, which we've test flew in a... Uh, in 2006, on the 6th of December, and one week later, Ati was flying it in the national championships, and he won the championship open class for the first time. And since 2006 until 2023, only one year, where John Coots was flying at 29, the Jays did not win the open class. So it was quite a, quite a remarkable achievement for us just, just in South Africa. We were also the first aircraft that was type certified by the South African Civil Aviation, um, there was actually one certified by the DCA, that's before the CIA, which was also a glider, an aerobatic glider, but I think their certification documents were just 40 pages, and I think ours were about 40 boxes full of certification documents. In any case, so we achieved this, and then finally we were also managing to construct quite a few of this aircraft, but on the very fourth one, we made a JS-1C for the open class, and this aircraft was revealed in Uvalde in 2014. And I think I told the story where nobody saw this aircraft except for this Potchefstroom crowd. And we landed, it took off from uh, somewhere in, uh, in Texas. And we landed in Uvalde the first time with nobody seeing it. So that was quite a milestone for us. And we actually changed the open class for quite a while. Until 2017, the Jays one made a massive impact in the open class. Winning the world championships in 2017, flown by Russell Cheatham. Um, and after that, the EB-29R took over and is now the, the best open-class sailplane in the world, which we have a little surprise next door to him, which we should probably reveal in about a couple of months. I think you can all remember when we revealed the JS-3, we only revealed it in 15 meter, also in 2017 with a momentous effort to transport this with 747s to, to Australia. So while we were completing the aircraft, we had a team that was just working on how to get this stuff into a 747. Initially asking Qantas, they just say, absolutely forget about it. It's not possible. The weight and balance will not work out. You will destroy those hinges in the door. You can destroy the roof and there's going to be a tow plane sticking through the roof on the passenger aircraft. And in any case, it's too hot and high. We cannot take off. And what do you want to do? Um, if, um, if, if you have to lift these things, you know, if you cannot, you cannot we, our people will not load it. We thought we will just have a lot of people load it in, in Australia, they must get it out. They will not leave it in the aircraft and bring it back. No way, Squanta said, no, 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 we have to have equipment to do it. So we raised them the question and asked, boys, if we can mitigate all of your five vicious risks, will you ship, will you fly us? And they said, yes. And then we started working on a plan. So the only way, I would just li highlight the center of gravity, but you can see we, we made our own containers that will be fit in there with the rudders. We, we had our, our Aussie agent who was the 747 cap, you know, not the, uh, the pilot officer who was flying to South Africa. He jumped out of the cockpit and went into the back and then he loaded the aircraft in while we were already in Australia. And for the weight of ballast, it was only possible to fly the aircraft when the aircraft was half full. And therefore we, we selected... Um, um, I think it was Christmas Eve where we selected where the aircraft was half full because then they could leave some of the fuel in the back of the tailplane to sort out the center of gravity. So Qantas had to do a massive center of gravity calculation because instead of having 11 tons of weight in the back, we only had about one ton, maybe even less. And therefore, it was massive calculation. But we finally arrived at it, and, and I think since then, we were really doing great jobs in, uh, in the JS-3. I think in Europe as well, the J3 has reached the Hall of Fame in the German community, um, named amongst the, how they call it, the 18 meter trinity, the J3, the Ventus 3, and the AS33. So we're very proud to be mentioned amongst this crowd. And I think there's a rumor has it that the J3 maybe have a little bit of an of a edge on the other two. That's what we believe, that's what we hope, and this is what the results are showing. So I think we regard it as a company of innovation and normally renowned for packing amazing aerodynamics by our bossy our aerodynamic engineer, 
our chief design aerodynamic engineer, who has the ability to package this in a very beautiful looking shape. It's one thing to make a good performing aircraft, but it's one thing to package it in an elegant, pleasing looking aircraft. Bossy, so kudos to you. That's amazing what you are doing. Um, there's a few things that what we did first in the gliding work. We were the first guys to certify a jet in a sailplane. So that's the first jet certified sailplane in the world. There's others who tried it but not certified. And we produced almost 250 of these jet certified ones. We were the first electrical aircraft with removable batteries that is certified. The self-launcher with removable batteries. We thought we would be the first 18 meter but the Schleicher was just slightly ahead of us. Um, but we, I think we have the most electrical self-launchers, um, gliders in the market to date. And we're the only guys who have uh, who took the effort to redesign the solo engine that it's now completely vibration for you. You guys see that shortly. But it's also the small things, and those are the crazy things that we are doing that people think, why are we doing this? We're having total energy and static probes on the tip. So just in that nice little picture there. Maybe it's the next one. I don't know if it's this picture. I think my mouse is a little, and me is not so happy. If you look there in the back of the tailplane, you see that we are picking up our pitot static ports in a different position. We have electrical rudder pedals. Maybe the reason is because we couldn't design the mechanical stuff properly. Um, we have sliding pockets, but and that was my design, boys. <laughs> the sliding pockets, my design. All right. And also the protection cover and instrument panel. Man, that is, if you don't have it, you're going to pay Alex a lot of money. And our latest idea is the easy peasy for men. Maybe I should give a little bit more gruesome detail here. Guys, come on. This, this is uh, restricted, age restricted. So if you're not 16 yet, please um, just, just go to the jumping castle just for a while. I have to explain this to you. Okay, guys, I think we take a small break and then I'm going to introduce our... Uh, Jay is team to us. Um, give me five minutes and then you continue and just uh, exposing Rob's glider and our team. Thanks very much for listening to my uh, technical, advanced, engineered stories. Have you heard the latest news that the new JS2 will have nothing on its panel but a screen? That will give the latest views from a satellite you choose that displays the sinking bed, the drifting green. There's no stick upon the floor, no rudders anymore, just two wires that you plug into your brain. A computer reads your mind through a fiber optic line. And with this confirmation flies the plane Honey, I need a new guide The one that we have obsolete Soaring's no fun, just 60 to 1 I can't expect to compete With a plane like this new JS2 I knew you decide it's a matter of pride, so I ordered us one yesterday. The hero's heading down, the dollar's gaining ground. It might get back to one to one again. So for just 200 grand, you can place an order with the man who promises the and three years from that day, he says just one more wait. The factory is quite busy now, you see. I know you're anxious to get through with your new JS2, but they've just announced the JS5. Honey, I need a new life. Soaring's no fun, just 60 to 1 Look, how can I expect to compete? Our investment is doomed, it won't trade it soon Hell, we 
you've only had it a week I knew you decide it's a matter of pride so I ordered us one yesterday 